Hi, everyone. I hope you're all well. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is James Kelly. I'm from Pluto Press, and I'm so honored and delighted to be joined by two brilliant speakers and thinkers, activist and public educator Francois Vergès and writer and activist Lola Olafemi, who will be chairing tonight's event. Tonight, we're here to discuss Francois's new book, which is available now, A Decolonial Feminism. Centering anti-colonialism and anti-racism within Marxist feminism, this powerful manifesto is a call to dismantle the systems of power that oppress us. For those of you who haven't yet, you can head over to plutobooks.com to pick up a copy of the book. This event also includes a Q&A section, so please feel free to ask questions in the chat below, and you can also tweet on the hashtag a decolonial feminism. That's all from me. Over to you, Lola. Hi everyone, um, thank you so much to Pluto for asking me to chair and um, to Francois for speaking to me. Um, I, want, I wanted to ask, um, I wanted to start Francois by asking for you, um, what are the principles of a decolonial feminism? Can you expand on it as a kind of framework of um, resistance and struggle against empire and all of the forms of domination that sustain it? Well, thank you and uh, I'm very happy uh, to have a, that conversation with you and thank you to Pluto. Well, uh, for me, I mean, the, I would say that the principle uh, uh, decolonial feminism will be radically anti-racist, anti-capitalist and anti-imperialist. I don't want to forget anti-imperialism, which I think is quite often forgotten. It's also for the liberation of the whole society. It's not just, you know, about women, equality of, uh, you know, and of men and women. It's really <clears throat> also, <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> Do not forget the memories and the struggle of women, you know, before us, especially in the global south, or black women in uh, everywhere. Uh, for me, uh, uh, also, the colonial slavery remains really the matrix of the world in which we live today. Still, the plantation, the organization, the architecture. So. The, that we, as long as we are still living in that world, we are not free. <coughs> so. um, I think one, one thing that uh, struck me when I was reading the book is how you so skillfully kind of framed the principles of decolonial feminism, especially in relation to temporality and especially in relation to ideas of kind of colonial memory. One thing you say, you say in the book, I take a stance against a temporality that describes liberation only in terms of unilateral victory against the reactionary. And that really spoke to me as somebody who works on the imagination and temporalities mm -hmm. and how um, uh, thinking against the current kind of temporal order and um, hegemonic regimes might allow us to make bigger and better and more kind of imaginative political demands. Um, so I, from that, I wanted to ask, um, how can decoloniality as a, as a kind of framework help us to rethink trajectories um, of our, the trajectories of our resistance movements and to help us move away from an understanding of liberation as a singular event, right? How can it you know, help us think plurally about what our political missions um, should be? Yeah, oh, thank you so much. I mean, in terms of temporality first, I would say that we always work with entangled temporality. Uh, absolutely not like the Western, you know, linear temporality of we go towards progress. We are still working with the past that we are, you know, that is not barely, you know, repaired. We are just starting to repair it and still in the process of being repaired and memory being retrieved and names being, you know, spoken. We are still, we are working with the present, which is just in front of us and with really also counteroffensive. And we're already working with the future because we know that the lives of the future generation of our children today or grandchildren are threatened by you know, capitalism, racial capitalism, and it's our patriarchy and all this. So this entangled temporality you know, really requires to, a leap of imagination in thinking how we, we think liberation because it's not just take that things and move it, you know, and transform it. We have to do always all this. So I will say that it's also very, um, in fact, very exciting to think about, uh, about that. And in terms of, uh, uh, then it expands also the speciality of our, I mean, the space of our struggle and the feeling that what is being worn over there, it's a win for us also 
over here. And, at, and But at the same time, it's that the fact that where we are fighting here, we are fighting for what we have to fight for. And um, I always tell that story because during the Vietnam War, there were some uh, European uh, communists who went to see uh, Ho Chi Minh and they met with him and say, what can we do and how can we help you and so on. And he had an answer that, um, again, that for me really struck me. He say, well, you go back to your country, it was Italy, and you do the revolution there. That will help us, you know. And so also it was against, you know, this question of saviorism you know, like we have to fight for these people because they are poor people. Do what you have to do where you are. So fight. And, all, and this fight will connect with the fight of other people. Because by freeing here, you contribute. Like when Haiti, you know, you have the Haitian Republic and the enslaved won the insurrection and the revolution, it was really a turning point for all the enslaved in the world. So it's also connecting these different notes of revolution and struggle together in circulation. One thing you, you kind of write about in, in the book as well is the, the black feminist principle of marunage and, and um, the idea that when we kind of situate an analysis of slavery that, that understands it as a process of wealth accumulation, um, then we can properly articulate a politics that is against capitalist foreclosure, one that refuses to kind of naturalize colonial suffering and violence. Um, so I, I was wondering how this principle kind of shapes um, your understanding of what a decolonial feminism um, offers us. How can it be a springboard for a kind of materialist and grounded imaginative um, uh, political demand or, or utopia? How, how might we use it to, to think differently about the way that we live? Yeah, I, I think that uh, the reappropriation of utopia, it's quite important. Because as I say, we are living in dystopia. We have been living in dystopia for a long time. And utopia could be absolutely appropriated as an incredibly you know, liberatory tool. In fact, to imagine that world that is not still there, but that we have to, to create and invent. But, we shall, but that world has already been, in, been existing here and there in the Maroon community, during, you know, in the Black women movement, wherever they were, you know, in Brazil or United States or UK or France, or in the struggle against the apartheid. I mean, all these different anti-colonial struggles. So we have nonetheless uh, an incredible library of utopian thinking of utopian really imagination in the sun that is not the the utopia of building just the the dream community that always hand badly right but it's constantly in the making that there is always a possibility to do better to and also to confront a new problem and find their solution to that new problem the best, you know the best solution we can do collectively and collaboratively for me, the maroon I've all, is very powerful because um, growing, of course, in, a, in an island where you have slavery, for me, they were the only free people, really free. I mean, because if the white people were not free, they were the subject of the king or, or the queen. They were really those who really took liberty in their hand and freedom and, and carve, you know, territorial freedom against everything. And also would dare to say, would dare to say, we will, free, we will be free. Freedom is possible. Freedom will come. Freedom will come. You know, and they, and they never, never see. You know, they never stop the fighting. Never. And for me, this is also an incredible strength for us. You know, the possibility of yes, there is no we, the the naturalization, normalization, the the power built around us can be constantly break. And that could be the power. That could be the power of decolonial feminism by using the, our imagination constantly, by constantly also daring, daring to imagine that it's yes, it's possible. Um, I do. The right to imagination is is very important uh, today because in a world that we are saturated by you know uh, um, image and things that that pretend to be imagination and in fact are just colonizing our mind. I, yeah, that, that really speaks to me. And I think 
it's what the imagination I think of the uh, imagination and as a process that brings that which does not previously exist into being right and that closes the the gap between the real and the possible and I feel like in in um, the book what you give us is an argument for closing that gap an argument for rethinking um, our political projects as plural as many right as as capable of multiple um, sets of analysis at the same time uh, yes, and also as uh, and uh, we have, uh, as I say, you know, we have to take the setback as setback. They are not defeat. defeat. We have also to rethink uh, this term of defeat that is, you know, revolution defeated or you know, anti-colonial struggle defeated. Uh, this all this this is the vocabulary of military. You know, of the military victory and defeat. We ha we ha must have the military. Uh, you know, reject this military vo vocabulary and take the the vocabulary of the long, long road to freedom, you know, and the long, but full of incredible moment of joy and an and incredible moment of energy and desire. So as, as you say, as, the, the, as you were saying, imagination comes also, goes also with desire, the desire, you know, to, for something. And also I, I insist on for joy and, and in a world that is made, made totally, um, I don't know, sad, you know, and, and not, uh, Full of artificial joy, it's artificial joy, and 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 that for me, yeah. So, yeah, imagination, imagination, the the power, the power to imagine, to break from that, uh, that there is there are alternative, there are mm. alternative, and that uh, we are capable of building them, of more. Um, I wanted to to ask also about civilizational feminism, which is a big um, kind of which structures your analysis in the book, um, and you call it um, you call it the ideology of empty re um, reactionaries who are kind of intent to affirm domination using the discourse of feminism in service of capital, and and I think we see this in the way that. Um, uh, Islamophobia has taken hold of um, Europe's imagination, right, and has posited Muslims as racial others. So I, I wanted to, I wanted to ask, um, can you speak to how liberal democracies' insistence on secularism, um, which has come to kind of shape feminist concerns in the UK, in um, in France, is connected to kind of ongoing legacies of empire? Yeah, I, I think that in fact for the feminists, for this feminist, you know of the civilizing mission, they are really, I can say, their time has come. You know, they were not as strong under colonialism and imperialism. They were there, I mean, their voice, they supported, but they were not dictating policy, you know, it was men. They got their revenge, I must say, you know, in the 2000s at the beginning, by effectively they offered the vocabulary of Islamophobia using women's rights. You know, and so they, they offer to the, con the conservative, to the right, to the far right, to, you know, and to a certain left, the vocabulary that would be acceptable to attack Islam and the Muslim, it would be the vocabulary of women's right, you know, the vocabulary of emancipating the veiled woman from subjugation and submission and so on and so forth. So, and suddenly they got a place in power, an incredible place, and, and they could come back and speak, you know, everywhere and have books and publish books and, and be quoted and, and be also getting a, a position of power, which will not, under, you know, underestimate also the kind of a narcissistic reward, you know, they became expert or they could be consulted and they will be at the European community or at the UN or wherever they were or some kind of foundation. So it gave them an incredible, incredible place. And, and in fact, it was, I think, both uh, the whole, uh, uh, certainly the old desire of still wanting to be at the top, you know, to be the one who knew what would be, the, what was women's liberation. They could get that. They had been, uh, a lot of them has been, in fact, I will say, disturbed by the anti-colonial movement and the movement of decolonization by saying, you know, like strong women speaking from the global south or, you know, minority in the north. And suddenly, you know, they, they were no longer in, in the position of the white savior of being able to say, you know, having strong women telling them, no, you know, we, we don't that. So it, it was really for them and they serve that, they serve absolutely. And um, and it gave them position of power, really, in the political, in the business world, 
in the in the in academia in uh, journalism it's we should not underestimate suddenly you know what what it is uh, they can have a book and suddenly be you know becomes you know interviewed everywhere uh, and it goes with a certain um, form of patriarchy that goes with a um I would say neoliberal patriarchy, not the kind of that we saw uh, with the former president of the United States, but that we see, for instance, of the, with the president of France or other a kind of a modern kind of a, um, masculinity, uh, you know, uh, absolutely affirmative of women's rights and 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 that that, and we we are absolutely ready to include some women in the in the circle of power. Uh, as long as effectively this remain within a certain frame of, uh, of uh, and where uh, anti-racism will be done in very uh, polite ways and uh, uh, you know and and but Islam Islam being really the enemy and that it was really for me I'm, I'm, I will defend that you know that it was feminists white feminists who gave this anti this Islamophobic vocabulary to the state. Because until then it was the far right and it could not be really uh, integrated. When feminists did it, it became you know, possible to, to speak in that vocabulary. They, they offered the, the ideological frame. I think it, it also speaks to how liberal feminism is invested in, like you point out in the book, is invested in propping up the nation state and they choose to do that through affirming the other, affirming um, the, the tension between uh, kind of two sets of groups um, at, at the very least. Um, I wanted to ask also about how um, you situate decolonial feminism as uh, Marxist, as clearly, you know, anti-capitalist, as, as clearly having a, a serious critique of capitalism um, uh, capitalism as a system of kind of, or a machine of dispossession. Um, and you begin specifically with the idea of the domestic worker who goes on strike or is forced to kind of clean ex, um, excrement um, in uh, train stations um, in order to get your reader to kind of recognize how capitalism designates who is worthy of, of a livable life. And I, I think about the terrain, the political terrain that we're, that we're in as feminists in this moment, where we're seeing a neoliberal drive to flatten our political demands, our movements, um, to de-radicalize feminism so that our concerns lay firmly within the realm of representation and identity. And these have become kind of, um, I would say, weights on the feminist movement, right? And, and so I wanted to ask you, um, how, how do we resist that? How do we um, ignore uh, uh, that desire to flatten movements, and I think to lower the stakes of what a feminism can offer, right? Yeah, um, absolutely. Yes, uh, it's a very important question because we do know that identity politics are not what they have been say. You know that what the media are, are doing or some right people, right wing people, but we do know also how they um, they have been also transformed of of neutral. Um, normalized, neutralized, pacified by a certain also commodity economy in which suddenly yourself become also a commodity. You can sell yourself and your, who you are and what I am and what I feel become in fact uh, also a certain uh, a capital that you can also uh, you know, bargain and, and circulate. And in the meantime, we forget effectively the material condition also of, of even that, you know, even that feeling this way or that way. And I started with a clinic woman because without them all over the world, the world will not function. The society will not function, whatever, any society. So to go back also some kind of structure, you know, like on which, what the system rests on, you know, and so how we can, you know, shake its foundation. And it will not just be by our, uh, the way I feel or the way I, I identify myself, it will be by really attacking, you know, uh, the master house, you know, and attacking with uh, effectively the tool that can dismantle the master house, because we are still living in the master house. We are still living in the architecture of the master house. This is still, we are still, we have not left really the plantation in a way. 
it's of course it's not exactly the same thing but when we have not left so um it it has been a very uh, of course smart uh, move from uh, from neoliberalism because in a way neoliberalism can say to you you can be whatever you want as long as you play the game and we will not forbid you we do see even for instance some tension sometimes between neoliberal and some you know let's order form of patriarchy and capitalism you know uh, and and the the younger one or younger one not in terms of age but will say but we need women we need black people we need you know asian and and, and in our business we need because we have to expand the business we have to open you know we have to because colonization is is absolutely at the art of capitalism Capitalism need to colonize our mind, our body, plants, world, planet, water, air, needs to expand. And uh, so I will say that as feminists, we have to look also at the structure, not just at, at, at what it does, um, uh, um, at, at my feeling, what is the structure if I want to attack uh, that thing that is destroying the planet and the, and the lives of billions of, of people of color all over the world. I have to, I have to really to look at the structure, and I, I have to go back effectively to the to a um call, you know, dismantle the master house, not with the master tools, you know. When you were talking, I, I was thinking about social reproduction theory and this question of what makes the worker possible. What are all of the kind of hidden processes yeah. um, that that create the worker that is that then goes on to be exploited? And you, you touch on this um, in the book, kind of shaping the kind of growth of um, social reproduction theory. And I, I was wondering what you thought about it in this moment. I feel like um, this moment, living in a pandemic, going through this, seeing how um, callous uh, governments have been, how they've abandoned their citizens, but also seeing all of the underpaid, um, under-acknowledged care work that, that keeps people alive. I wonder if, yeah, you had any thoughts on the importance of so, um, social reproduction theory in um, building a framework for decolonial feminisms. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, we, we have a long, uh, of course, we have a incredible literature about that, but I do think we have to also perhaps uh, look today at the, at, at, at the whole policies about social reproduction, you know, but also at the extension of the destruction of life, at the, at the fact that uh, the, the introduction to make kinship or make community is growing, you know, are growing, you know, in, in the way that could be through, through the exhaustion. We, we are exhausted, people are exhausted, you know, so you don't have the same time to give, you know, affective ties. People are exhausted, people are stressed. Uh, there is much more mental suffering, uh, much, much more so violence, incredible violence that is also absorbed. And then, or, uh, and some people uh, cannot do otherwise than, you know, uh, express that violence onto the people who are closer to them. There is also for me, uh, the, uh, the very clear, uh, a very clear thing, the fact that who, who um, deserve protection and who does not deserve protection. And as you say, for instance, the people you know in this job, but even the question of children, so many children are born every day in the global south or in minority in the global north, and they are already condemned not to have any childhood. At a moment when there is a growing concern with a child and how the child and the development of the child and what the child need and so on and so forth, which are, you know, we are all for, but at this, at this very moment of this incredible concern and discovery for the well being of the child, you have billions of children who are who will be criminalized, who will be treated like adults, and uh, who will not be treated like children, who will not deserve childhood, who will not have any childhood. And so that also for me is uh, the, the social reproduction being broken. And so, so that to attack really the very foundation of making community and making kinship. The really isolation, isolated people, people against each other, uh, building individuals, but individuals not in the sense of the self-made person, but also of the of the lost person, of the person who has no the isolation. So there is a way of of also uh, uh, how can I say going back to the uh, to uh, 
uh, feminist, um, revolutionary materialist, you know, uh, theory of social reproduction that also takes all this into account. The question of uh, community making, kinship making, uh, health also, uh, access to health, access to education, access to all this, you know, and not, uh, so perhaps I will, I'm, I'm not, of course, I, I don't, I'm not into the white feminist things, which will be, you know, domestic, uh, sharing domestic duties only, or having access to uh, uh, freedom of, you know, in, in reproduction, or whatever. No, for me, social reproduction, it's very, the way in which effectively um, uh, neoliberalism and, and all, in all its form are doing everything to break community making, to break kinship, to break effectively uh, for, any form of social reproduction that escape its its uh, its power and its laws. And in that way, I think maybe we can think about decolonial feminism as a kind of politics of relation, of kind of relational solidarity, of of keeping each other alive in that sense. Exactly. Um, of of you know of of. Uh, saying that of course we have to make family we, we can of course there is a critical family and it all patriarchal family da 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 but there is also we know that the invain i mean other form of family are possible and the survival of many many people in the colony or in you know uh, among black people in the global north have been you know so family not family in the sense you know uh, dad mom uh, the kids the cat and the dog but in terms of effectively uh, possibly of solidarity of of support of of uh, of getting together that is absolutely fundamental and the fact that you do you construct families through the struggle you have family and and everyone, uh, I remember, uh, you know, because I, when I was little, I knew people in in jail or whatever, and they were saying what what made them, you know, support saying They knew that people outside were with them, even though they did not see them. It was like effectively the the the, the care that they did not feel materially, you know, uh, it was not concrete in the sense that they, they, they could not, for instance, even see them. But the fact that they knew that there was there was a care for them, that people care for them, uh, man, demonstrating, writing letters, coming to them, was absolutely important as effectively a source of vitality and, and, uh, and, 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 and strength. And I think that is extremely, uh, that what, uh, we need to to nurture relationality. Yes. I want to come um, to come back to to something that you said before, and something that's in the book um, that capital is the colonizer. Um, and I, I think what's clear when reading the book is is you outline how France's position as a colonizer is kind of crucial to any analysis of state development, of its treatment and understanding of uh, specific forms of liberal feminism. Um, so I wanted to ask, can you kind of explain um, how the civilizing mission um, in, of the colonizer kind of lives on through what you call civilizational uh, feminism and through feminationalism as well? Yeah. Well, I, I do think that we, we cannot understand modernity, I mean, Western modernity, without going back constantly to effectively slave trade, slavery, and the rise of capitalism uh, and racial capitalism. Uh, there, there is no possibility uh, to understand to understand that. So there, there is this, um, um, it, it's extremely important to constantly going back to who is exploited, how people are exploited, what are the laws being, you know, taken to maintain exploitation, to maintain inequality and injustices, you know, the constant, constant reworking of this to, to allow that. And there is no, I mean, extractivism, I've been at the art of effectively the wealth of Europe, and still, if we look at France, France is still extracting from the African continent a lot of things that serve its industry. And if France is one of the you know, fifth uh, richest country on earth, it's not because, because the French have specific talent or, you know, or qualities, it's because the, the, their country have, be, have been stealing for, for people and country for century, you know? And this is not what they, they understand. So, and, and it was fabricated that it was, it was almost associated with their quality, like ingrained quality, 
you know, a French country of the human rights and so on and so forth. And not because of that, you know, not because of that. And the forgetting of this, the forgetting and, and the transformation of France as only the generous France, you know, bringing freedom to the world and bringing equality at the same time, violating constantly this principle is what is still you know, very difficult for people to resist because it's a legend, it's, it's a beautiful narrative, of course, and uh, I understand people <laughs> will hang to it, it's better. Um, and so, but through that, what is forgotten is that Europe, as Césaire said, uh, you know, has been indefendable for centuries. Mm -hmm. It has been the Europe of anti-Semitism, the Europe of you know, colonialism, of imperialism. It's a Europe which needs really, really to look at itself, really, really to look at itself. And, and really try to do its own decolonization. Because there's all there with this, in, in, also in, to answer your question, it's like for a lot of people in Europe, in the left, I'm not talking about the right, decolonization has been for people who have been colonized and not for them. And I always, you know, uh, go back to what Césaire say in discourse on colonialism of what he calls the shock in return. He said, you cannot enslave and colonize without it coming back to your country, without coming back in insinuated in, in, in your law, in your literature, in your way, of, in your art, in your way of thinking, and so on. And that shock of return, um, which uh, Césaire saw in, in World War II, in, uh, by saying, okay, what you have been doing, what white people have done to white people, you have been, white people have been doing it to people of color for century. And I see it also today in the shock of, uh, this shock of return, in the return of the repress of the colonial history uh, because of young, younger generations saying, no, we, we are here, you know, going standards by. Uh, transformation also um, in the, I mean, a deep transformation of the society and they resist that. Um. It makes me think, bringing up Césaire, um, about how you also talk about the kind of specter of uh, globalization and how so many of third world movements and feminist movements have been defanged by essentially, you know, corporations um, who kind of impose de um, de uh, developmental, sorry, practices um, from the kind of uh, IMF, from the, U um, from the UN, from the World Bank, et cetera, that have reduced the terrain of struggle so that it becomes about how the nation state adheres to a specific set of kind of principles that are outlined at the table of power and not so much a kind of grassroots struggle over resources. Um, and so, yeah, I, I was wondering if you had any um, kind of thoughts on that, if you could expand on that phenomena, because we've seen, I think, especially with the UN, we've seen how the language of, and the discourses of feminism have been co-opted for the, for the purposes of reaffirming the idea that nation states should exist, right? And so I, I'm, I'm interested in what you think about that. Yeah, I, um, I think, for, I mean, first we, are, we have constantly to recover uh, the, the root of solidarity uh, that existed, that constantly existed, that trying also to, to, to um, uh, disrupt this, this root of thought and circulation of ideas. Um, and I've, I've always been, been there. But the, 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 effectively, the, the fact that development now rests on women, and uh, I mean, the discourse and the policy of development rests on women, is part of, you know, we could go back to what Fanon said in uh, Algerian Veil that uh, the policy is, uh, you know, take the woman, you know, separate the woman from the from their community. And in, as soon as you have that, you break the community. You, you, you know, you weaken the community. And I see uh, that policy uh, still going on, you know, transformed, but still going on. And uh, but uh, this is go this goes on with at the same time an incredible exploitation of women of, of color through the world. So it's it's a, it's a discourse that uh, almost how say advertisement for effectively development policies and different foundation that uh, use that. And um, in the meantime, the incredible precarization and vulnerabilization of women's lives everywhere, the incredible violence unleashed on women of color everywhere. The incredible, I mean, rape has become, 
it's not an exception at all. It's absolutely a, a daily tool of domination of terror uh, to discipline women. And not just men disciplining women, it's the, the, the disciplining of women so that they will work and say nothing, so that we will accept the condition of work, they will accept you know, exploitation. So this, uh, and I, I'm not saying just cynicism by, by United Nations and other foundation. I do think that it's a, it's a constant, uh, this constant work of capitalism and colonialism. On the one hand, you repress, you censor, you, you kill. And on the other hand, you always try to detach a certain, you know, small number of, of, of the population that then will become your servant that will serve you know your your system and that had always been that i mean patriarchy has been able to to have women at, at its accomplice um and, uh, and uh, so this policy will have women at, at their accomplice um but i will i will constantly uh, underline when i'm being told that uh, the number of women uh, being killed every day were you know uh, um, activists, uh, uh, indigenous activists, or black activists, or, 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 or for instance, forbidding them to unionize. I mean, any, any kind of organization which is really in the, and I will, uh, and you know, that, that in fact, this is what concerns billions of women. The other, it's just, you know, on the surface. And it's part, it's part of the pacification. It's part of pacification. Pacification, we have to rethink how the politics of pacification are being done today. Not exactly the way they were done in the 19th century, but you, they are still going on. And to think, I think, about all of the way methods that feminist movements get subsumed into the state. Um, and and in, in that regard, I, I wanted to ask you about all of the kind of revolutionaries that you evoke in the process of making your um, analysis, people like um, Fatima Bedour and Claudia Jones. And I feel like um, maybe to, to, to go back to this idea of time and temporality and remembering and forgetting so many of these revolutionary women um, and the anonymous women who you also write about in the book um, are people who are, we're tasked with kind of excavating information and knowledge about them because they have been forgotten by mm -hmm. European history. And I, I was wondering through a decolonial framework, how we might rethink the process of remembering so that the task is not always to, um, to explore the colonial archive and excavate those people who have um, existed outside of the grand narrative of history. Mm. Um, I'm interested in how our feminist movements don't get stuck in that trap of always constantly having to battle a purposeful erasure, right? Because we, I think sometimes we think of erasure as um, innocent and it's not. So I was wondering what your thoughts are, are on yeah, that. Yeah, that, that's a very, um... I mean, first I will say, okay, uh, we have always fought for visibility. I mean, to make things visible, but uh, we perhaps we have to rethink the question of visibility and visibility. You know, like uh, if we want to use these two terms, uh, when we need to make ourselves visible and when we need to make ourselves invisible, to retreat, to hide, to withdraw, to go underground, to, to maroon. And who and all this negotiation between these two strategy is very important because visibility. I mean, there is there is an incredible capacity by the state, incredible capacity by the to absorb things, to I mean to resist for five six years because and suddenly to find a way to neutralize it, to pacify and to be able to, you know, to have t-shirt with, I am a decolonial feminist, you know, being sold and made by women in Bangladesh and whatever, and I would be very proud to wear them. So we know that and effectively, so there are moment, uh, and this is the way, I think it's uh, uh, literature is a way of, of escaping that, you know, uh, poetry, a uh, lot of artistic practice and, and certainly ways also of doing research uh, today. Uh, that can escape to uh, the, the constant uh, uh, tension we feel between the frame of visibility and invisibility as they have been in fact defined by the political of, of representation, of Western representation and aesthetics. That I mean, politics of aesthetics, which has also erased their own uh, popular classes, right? Um, so the, the, 
the strategy of, of erasure are, are strong. That second, um, I would say, or third order, I would say also we have to work between um, bringing some person, uh, I mean, personality, and not to personalize history either. Yeah, to, 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 to fetishize, I mean, to, you know, to forget that it's always collective and how to find the vocabulary to describe, or not to describe, but to bring, um, uh, to insist on the fact that without collectivity, you don't have to have struggle. That, there is no, that's not true. You never have one person only. That person is, beca is because also cert certain quality perhaps will detach as herself, but nonetheless, she needs a community. She needs a collective around her. And that how we, tell that story is effect is uh, is something we have to pay attention to we have uh, i would say to multiply also autonomous uh, uh, you know space where they are they are digital or not digital uh, in which we say uh, the thing the way we want to see um, we also allow to for fragmented the story we don't have everything but that's fine that's that's not it's okay when I was doing, you know, when I, I work for a museum in Réunion Island about the history of population, you do not have any object uh, that will testify for the life of the enslaved, none, okay? They all disappeared, they were lost, people do not care, whatever. And you know that in, in the West, the museum, the, the object tells a story. You don't have an object, you don't have a story, right? So no object, no story, no, no narrative, people are lost. And so I say, okay, let's do, narrative without starting with the object. We don't have an object, but we have a life. It's not because we don't have an object that we don't have the life. So how could we bring fragment of that life to restitute at least some presence, some form of presence? And how will we use a tool of literature, poetry, theater, cinema, music, and different, to bring them together to restitute something? And that, and the object, there will be no object, but it's not because you do not have an object that you do not have you did not have a human being. So it's also to think uh, through that, uh, through uh, to uh, also perhaps uh, challenge uh, the rigid frame of representation and visibility as they have been imposed onto us mm. also. Thank you so much. I, um, I just want to say actually, uh, because I forgot to say at the beginning, please do um, ask your questions in the chat um, and I'll um, ask Francois them on your behalf. So I'm just gonna ask another question to give people time to kind of um, submit their questions. Um, I, I wanted to ask about um, the idea of waves and generations. I think one thing that our feminist movements across Europe, I think lack, or especially in the UK is, is a space or spaces for intergenerational conversation. And I feel like this is very in line with re ideas of rethinking temporality, ideas of rethinking um, remembrance and, and reckoning with the past and present as contemporaneous instead of, you know, constantly, uh, instead of, you know, successive. So I was wondering um, in the kind of feminist spaces that you're positioned in, in France, are there spaces for intergenerational conversation? How do you relate to um, the demands of feminist movements that are um, coming up, you know, behind you or coming up at the same time as you? Is there space for that kind of conversation? I think we have to to reinvent them. They were broken for a while. Uh, I was, uh, you know, because I, I do a lot of public education, as we say, a lot of young people telling me. We don't know what our parents did and having the feeling that their parents did nothing, did not fight back. You know, this, this idea that even the power and media have been, you know, that uh, they were in fact, they, they work, they work without, uh, without protesting and you should do like that. And which is absolutely not true. Uh, the intergenerational uh, connection is for me absolutely essential, absolutely essential. It's also because it's, it's the resistance against this constant fragmentation into individual, you know, into abstract uh, individual, you know, who will be living by themselves and, and reinvent themselves every day as, as wall and total, which uh, for me is it's, 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 it's pure illusion. Uh, so we have to, to reinvent this intergenerational connection and space. We have also to, um, 
there is a certain uh, contempt for old people in the West. You know, they are useless. They, they, and also with the pandemic in front, the, the, the power try really to oppose uh, elder people from, you know, young people by saying, you know, and they try to have this, uh, this war because it's their way of constantly, as I say, I mean, one of the really very important strategy for them is like to absolutely in the community and kinship making. So I would say it's very important also because uh, um, we have also to valorize again the knowledge that older people have, which is not only from books and from academia, but also from living and, uh, you know, especially in community uh, uh, coming from the global source, I mean, migrant community or other, of knowing what is it to, um, to survive and to live and to make a life, not just to survive, but to make a life for their children and uh, for themselves and to reinvent a restaurant and club and music in which they could, you know, like bring against, you know, life from and, uh, and form of struggle and demonstration and incredible creativity and inventivity which, from which we can learn. So, uh, yeah, uh, I, this is for me extremely uh, important and the, the notion of wave and new generation and generation Y, Z and whatever is absolutely uh, in, absol um, for me belong to the world of advertisement, you know, absolutely the world of advertisement, but not the world in which we live. And we, I don't know in the UK, but here, but even not just in France, but in, U in Italy or Spain or, or, or elsewhere, a lot of young people went back to their parents or grandparents during the pandemic. So we saw that the importance nonetheless, so it was parents or grandparents or some member, but the need to construct community living, the, the, the absolute importance also perhaps to rethink um, how we're gonna build uh, autonomous community uh, together not necessarily through family ties, but through effectively uh, friendly, I mean, some form of friendship and relationality that we construct and, and have this. The way in which uh, people uh, did um, in the state or elsewhere, or even in Europe, of building even, yeah, uh, build an entire building in which they live or a neighborhood in which they live, mm -hmm. because we Need that we really need, need, need that. Otherwise, we are too. Uh, it's it's a very brutal world. It's very brutal. Power is very brutal, and uh, and uh, has no hesitation in uh, breaking breaking lives. You know, not people lives. I mean, the way we 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 think. Uh, I mean, what is living? So intergenerational, yes. And also, not only those who live, but those who were who are, who are before us, long before us, and whose spirit and words uh, enlighten us, or, or, or give us to read something from someone I mean, two centuries ago, and and it's it's very words are very important. The circulation of um, imagination again. I mean, this word that feed our imagination, feed our, you know, being every day. Mm. That's part also of the international uh, connection. Mm. Thank you so much, um, Francois. There are um, a few questions that people would like to ask you. So the first one is, where do you position digital technologies in relation to decolonial feminist struggles today? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I will do a very banal answer. I mean, digital technology, as we know, can be totally useful, and I've been able to expand a lot of things and make uh, and and having uh, the circulation of of text, uh, images, and much faster and uh, and than the use uh, than than we could do, especially now because of you know of the restriction. So they are uh, effectively very important. Um, so I will say. Digital, I mean, all the technology have always served struggle. They, they, they are always, you know, uh, of course, they, they can be used to hinder 
and to uh, the struggle, but therefore it would be news. I mean, we know printing was a very important for the colonized and, and enslaved. So digital technology, I don't see any problem. Um, I, I, but we do know, we do know that all the time these tools behind them, you have company, you have this. And, and for me, it's, uh, we have also to think the possibility of this technology where some so still on the extraction of where I mean, minerals in Africa, of you know the fact that of course we have smartphone and we can da 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 do this, but this smartphone are done because effectively there was exploitation and people in so exploitation of, of where uh, minerals in Africa and exploitation of uh, women in Asia putting them together. So my point is like of course this, but we have to cross like to situate ourselves in this incredible entanglement of power inequality. So we have to be aware of them. I'm not saying we don't use them, but I, I must know what I'm doing. I must know what I'm able to do on what it stand. And that's, uh... Thank you so much. Um, somebody else asked, um, I'd love to know your opinion on the role of law in colonial domination. Is it even possible to use the law or legal mechanisms in a decolonial uh, slash feminist way? Well, of course, we know the role of law in colonial domination. I mean, without the law, there will not have been uh, the, you know, the legitimacy of dispossession of land grabbing. I mean, it, it was incredible. All the, you know, from, of course, 17, but even 19th century of imperialism laws was was very important. We do know also that even during slavery, uh, enslaved people could use the law against their master. I mean, they understood the role of the law also of, of turning you know, against the master, its own tools. Uh, but um, so we we know that. But in terms of colonial decolonial feminism, it's always a constant. Uh, a, I mean, it's, it's thinking about the situation. Okay, what I'm fighting against now. Okay, can I use the law for that aspect of my struggle? And then I need to also. Um, built, uh, you know, solidarity, and then I need this, and then I like that. So the law is not just the only strategy; it's one of them. It's one of them, and they can be useful. And we know, we know that, for instance, fighting for the freedom of expression against censorship of media is extremely important. You know I mean? So, and we will use the law. We will go to the tribunal. We will say, okay, my lord, we want this and so on. We will know. I mean, the the law can be, of course, a, a, a tool not of liberation, but a tool of resistance. It's a tool of resistance. I mean, very important. And all the laws that are more or less progressive have been won because of struggle. No, no state has, made, you know, has a, a, a voted a law that would be, for instance, a little more uh, you know, for rights or, um, or uh, I don't know, you know uh, an employment right or whatever uh, by by generosity it always has been you know because they have been struggled so i will say we have to fight but we have to be careful also of the law especially now of the use by neo neoliberal by liberal feminists of the law that they are using also the law to even uh, reinforce uh, surveillance and control of um, people of color especially of men of color and uh, they are for, so we have to be very careful between the use of the law and the criminalization and penalization of, of, uh, of people, which uh, uh, white, fem white liberal feminists are using. I mean, they are in fact asking for more laws uh, to protect themselves. And through this protection, they are reinforcing criminalization and prison and imprisonment. They are absolutely, you know, carceral feminism, as we say, or punitive feminism. So we have to be careful with the law. Somebody asks, um, what role do you see for decolonial knowledge production within institutions of con coloniality, such as of the university? Yeah, that's a very difficult thing, yes. It's a different thing because, of course, there is possibility. The point being that the university is a structure, is a structure of power, is a hierarchical structure, is a white male dominated structure, or if it's not white, is male dominated. And so it's very difficult to think about a, a pedagogy, a way of teaching 
knowledge production transmission that is respect you know that respect uh, difference but uh, we can nonetheless carve possibility because for now i mean the, for me for instance if i when i was teaching i have the responsibility of young people coming to my class and i cannot tell them oh that's stupid don't come the institution it's just you know a bunch of things i need to in fact reinforce um to tell them they are absolutely right to be curious they are absolutely right to look for that uh, i am i must i can help them read this or read that become autonomous learn learn to be curious learn to ask yourself question nothing around the world in which we live is not natural as they say so learn that and this it's uh, for me uh, decolonial pedagogy in the university will be to absolutely uh, make a student um, sure of themselves of their and, and and then they are the right to ask they have the right to be curious they have a right to to search that will be the first decolonial pedagogy, I will say. And then, of course, um, suggesting reading, suggesting practice. But this, this autonomy, which usually the university want to break, you know, want you to be uh, to conform. I will say the, that would be to win for that and build collective. Find other student with whom to work. Find other student to to start a collective or whatever. N never stay alone by yourself break isolation that's absolutely fundamental so but the question of pedagogy for me is uh, is very important uh, and in fact uh, important uh, to to develop uh, decolonial pedagogy feminist pedagogy you know from below from below not from above from below it's very um it's difficult because we are so much um from from when we when we start school, uh, we are we are taught to to listen quietly, not to challenge authority, uh, and so we have to relearn. We have to unlearn to learn. We have to unlearn a lot so we can learn again. Um, I actually wanted to ask about um, essentialism and how a, a decolonial feminism works against. Um, essentialism. We know obviously that the, the work of coloniality, the work of colonialism was to root ideas of wom uh, woman, man, etc. inside, firmly inside the body. And we, I think across Europe we're seeing a resurgence of a desire for um, gendered essentialism specifically. And we're seeing how white women use that as a way to shore up their own, the innocence of whiteness, but also their own position as, as victim. Mm -hmm. um, and so what does decolonial, um, what is the relationship between um, anti-essentialisms and uh, decolonial thinking? Yeah, I mean, um, uh, I mean, is, is this, this for, I mean, essentialism is essentially, <laughs> essentially a protection. <laughs> it's a protection from, from in fact, from, uh, from reality. I mean, uh, the, the complexity of, of your own life, you know? Uh, and so it's it's a really uh, it's defensive it's defensive, and it's the fear it the, it's it's a form of, uh, it's expression of the fear of in fact oh my god but if I open myself to the world and to difference I'm going to get lost, uh, and so if I believe myself to be uh, that uh, whiteness is something that uh, give me access to the entire world and. Uh, I don't know, give me a place, a, a, a safe place in the world, then I feel, you know, I don't have to ask myself a question. So essentialism is really a, a protection, but a protection, I will say, perhaps also because um, there is a, a certain sense of all this is uh, is fake and, uh, and uh, it's, it's a fantasy of, of superiority, but it is so um it's really for me protection i do think that people who are you know when we know that we are not i mean this essentialism we are much more stronger much more stronger it's presented as as uh, oh my god but that would be very difficult no it's it's incredible strength i'm amazed by you know like uh, as soon as you give that up uh, it's 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 a lot of strength uh, but, but um 
a white, a white Europe was built really uh, century after century on this belief that there was an essence of Europeanness that rested on the idea of a higher civilization and, uh, and, uh, and also a destiny, some kind of destiny in the world and that they have to give that up. But uh, they, they, are, they, they will have to give that up. That, uh, um, but um, this question of man, woman, and how we will hang on to that, I mean, how they hang on to that, it's, um, it's also falling apart. And I, I, I suppose the more, um, I can say, um, the fact that they, they, you have backlash against uh, uh, the multiplicity of genders uh, and identification is um, then feed the anxiety. The anxiety, I mean, the, the, the amount of attack and anxiety, it's because they already know that it's, it's lost. It's a lost battle, it's, but, you know, especially with young people today. And, um, but yeah, yeah, I would say, um, it, on, it, it's, what is, I mean, there we go to a certain question of uh, why do human beings hang on so on something that is clearly uh, not uh, working, you know? It's really not working, but uh, it's uh, it's a diff it's very defensive, yeah. Yeah, I, I really agree with that, and I think once we understand gender as a kind of regime of intelligibility, as a means through which we understand each other, we can understand its centrality in the in the civilizing mission, as you kind of outline in the book. Um, Somebody asks, could you please speak to the counter-revolutionary effects of neoliberal, uh, sorry, neoliberalism colonizing feminism? Um, and I think this is, this is another way of saying, you know, how might we begin to articulate a politics that, um, you know, is against the state, against property, um, against the ownership of land and resource, uh, mm -hmm. one that is against capital in, and for life, essentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's... Um... Of course, in terms of uh, uh, without private property, uh, private property is absolutely a very important foundation of uh, whiteness of a certain form. Without private property, you don't have that. You don't have uh, and don't and remember that white women benefited from private property before having other rights. And so, even in their narrative about uh, you know uh, acquiring right, they they forget quite often that they had the right to property, to private property before having the right to vote or the right to go to school or whatever. So private property is absolutely fundamental and we have to fight against, uh, again, uh, I mean, show how private property is absolutely fundamental in the organization of inequity and injustices, uh, of de deposition and depriving so many people from this and that's how it's connected with the state. The politics against, I mean, feminism, the, 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 the counter-revolution, the neoliberal counter-revolution, um, it's, it's, um, it's attacking this feminism rather than colonizing them. I mean, state feminism is totally on the side of that. We have talked about it uh, uh, quite a lot this tonight. But I will say um, it understands the revolutionary feminism of black feminism or feminism, multicolonial feminism, all this feminism that resists Muslim feminism that resists them as effectively uh, fighting against private property and therefore against the state. So how do we uh, fight? I will say, of course, there is the, 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 the knowledge that we have to have about this law, how the law in, uh, uh, work. It's very, uh, it's, I mean, we have really to read about that. But we have also to, um, uh, against what we have been saying, um, the politics of relationality, which are a politics of, sort of sharing, of uh, bringing together our forces also. Um, because sometimes with a very little, we can do a lot. I saw, you know, for instance, what you do with the family, family's library, it's, it's, it's huge, it's really huge, you know. Uh, and so it's it there, it's huge. And so we have uh, really to build more and more of this uh, space that escape uh, the laws of, uh, of, uh, 
of the private property slash patriarchy slash neoliberalism and state. Um, because they may not look, I mean, of course, they are not uh, the same, uh, they do not have the same power of big multinational, but they have incredible power. Incredible. Power. I mean, for the for a young woman or young queer or lesbian or a trans who, who is looking for something and and find your your what you are doing, for instance, it's it's huge. We cannot, you know, uh, underestimate that. It's all these things which are important. So the multiplication of this space that we can call maroon, autonomous uh, uh, community, whatever. But the point is that. We offer something that you're not alone. There have been people before you. There will be people, there will be people with you. There is a huge library of knowledge. There is a huge source archive of incredible people, incredible struggle that are absolutely energizing. Even when we are in the deepest of deepest of darkness, you know, uh, of, of what's happening. Um, they are there, and I think this also is a space of hope. But you know, um, hope for fighting, not the kind of you know like a universal hope, but um, the true one, the true hope. So I will say that that are the political against state and private property that we can develop. Thank you so much, um, Francois. I actually want to end by reading the last paragraph of your book and really encouraging everybody to um, go and buy it because I think it's brilliant. Um, but you say, we want to implement utopian thinking intended as an uplifting energy and force, as a presence and as an invitation to emancipatory dreams and as a gesture of rupture, to dare to think beyond that which is presented as natural, pragmatic or reasonable. We do not want to construct a utopian community, but to return all of its creative force to dreams of defiance and resistance, justice and freedom, happiness and kindness, friendship and wonder. Um, I want to thank you again for being in conversation with me, Francois. It's been so thank wonderful. You, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you again to Pluto as well for yeah, participating in this conversation.